God is in the business of big, but he tends to work through the little things we can bring. A little faith like a mustard seed, the smallest of beginnings, with the potential to grow into the largest of trees. A little oil that as we bring as an offering can fill jars to the limit of our faith. A bit of bread and some fish offered in obedience so others can be fed. A few coins, a sacrifice overlooked by human eyes, but powerful in God's hands. What could God do with your little? If we do the little things like they're big things, then God will do the big things like they're little things. Oh, morning church, how are you going? Amazing, amazing group of people. Oh, there's Wendy Chamberlain. Hello, Wendy. Welcome this morning. Wendy was uh, one of the most amazing small group pastors in the, in the world. It's so good to have you back here today. Huh? Children's church, sorry, small group. I was just watching a small group. So good. And that what she planted all those years ago in this place is prospering and growing. So it's just so amazing. So good to have you here this morning, Wendy. Welcome. It's, it's so good to have you here this morning. And we're in this series about what's, what you do with some small things and what God can do with the small things. And you should have received a packet of seeds. Everyone get a packet of seeds? They're mustard seeds. Really important seeds in the Bible. You hear them talked about a lot, and uh, Jesus talked about them a lot. And uh, we couldn't put one in because they're just so small. And uh, mustard seeds are one of those incredible things. I think seeds are amazing. You look at what a seed can produce, and you can grab one of those seeds out, and if you were to plant that seed, you can actually get a tree. And there's a tree should come up on the screen, and that's a mustard tree seed. A mustard tree that produces mustard seeds. So that little seed, you take one of those little seeds and put it in some soil and look after it. You can end up with that without those animals who ate all the bottom of the tree. But I think the thing about exciting about seeds is the potential that's in them. You grab one of those seeds and you plant it and you end up with a tree. But more than that, you end up with millions of other seeds. And that's one of the incredible things with God that I find is that you can take that little thing there and one of the marvels of creation and plant it and end up with millions more. Which is pretty incredible, really, isn't it, when you think about it? But sometimes I don't think we think about it. I think we, you know, we, we take for granted that we walk out and we see trees and we see the different things and you go into the carnival of flowers and you see all these incredible flowers that we have and trees that we have and beautiful things that we have, particularly here in Toowoomba, but it comes out of something very, very small. And if we plant that seed, we can see incredible things happen. And, and Mark 4, 30 to 32 says it this way. Then he said, this is Jesus talking, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God or what parables shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground, it is smaller than, the seeds, than all the seeds in the earth, but when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, and shoots out large branches so the birds of the air may rest under its shade. That if you take one of these seeds and plant it, you can actually create a tree that becomes beneficial to others. And it's a bit like the kingdom of God, that if you take the kingdom of God and you, you actually involve yourself into the kingdom of God, you can make an incredible difference for others. And, and we can see the kingdom of God is not just about ourselves, it's about others. I think about Jesus when, when he went to the cross. And if you think about this process of the cross, that when he went to the cross, it was for all about us, wasn't it? We had how we encountered God. We encountered God through Jesus going to the cross. The Holy Spirit was sent and... He died for us. He died for the forgiveness of our sin. He died to remove the guilt of sin. He died to give us eternal life and salvation. But post the cross, everything he did was for others. That it was all about what we create in us is for others. 
He said, go for and go therefore and make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples. It's about others. It's about the planting of our faith is not just for us, it's for others. It's actually, we take this seed of faith and when we plant it, the benefit's for others, not just us. And sometimes I think we get stuck in the us. Most of us are like the rest of us. And we get stuck in the us. God, what is in it for us? When we plan our faith, it's like the kingdom of God. It's not just for us. It's for others. We take this seed of faith, and I want to talk to you about faith this morning, because I think without faith, the Scripture says it's impossible to please God. And I think if we take Christianity without faith, it becomes just a religion. It becomes something that we just do. It has to be the activation of faith in our lives to see the kingdom of God come. You see, the potential that's in this seed, the only way you, re- you realize that potential is you take it and plant it. The only way you realize it. You can crush it and have mustard for your steak, but then the potential's gone, it's just for you. But if you take it and plant it, Take it and plant that. If you take and plant that seed of faith that you have in your life, you'll see it come for others. You take it and plant it, and then you add things like, just add water. Add sunlight like we have this morning. And all of a sudden, this thing grows. But one of the key things, it has to be planted. and has to be planted in good soil. If you plant something in poor soil, it won't grow. If you plant something and constrain it, it becomes like a bonsai plant and becomes very small because it gets constrained. But if you plant something and if you plant it and let it grow and and, and do it well and plant it in good soil, it actually grows and it grows to actually help other people. Matthew chapter 17, 20 and 22 says this, So Jesus said to them, and this was talking about he just... They couldn't cast a devil out of a person. So there was a a young person that had a devil in them. And the disciples were having trouble. They couldn't cast it out. And this is how Jesus answered them. He said, so he said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have the faith of a mustard seed. I love the way Jesus always uses pictures to explain stuff. That it wasn't, oh, well, let's get into some deep teaching about faith. We need to understand this. We need to know that where faith comes from in the Greek and the Hebrew. He said, no, no, no. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and be removed. The mountain speaking in this case was a, was a devil in a person's life. You can speak to that mountain that's there and be removed, cast it out. You can speak to the challenges in your life. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, something very small, you can actually do something incredibly great. And the thing that I love about these things that Jesus explains is that faith, no matter what size it is, there's a mustard seed of faith in every person's life. But he doesn't want us to just stay a seed. He actually wants us to plant it and grow it. Hebrews 11.1, one. it's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if we want to please God, we really do need to know what faith is. We really should understand this as Christians of what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of him things hoped for. Faith is not hope, but faith is the substance of th- what things hoped for. Faith is something tangible of hope. Faith is easily explained as knowing. I know that I know that I know. So what's hope? 
Hope is that thing that we have. It's that picture that we have. It's that thing that we want. I hope for this. I hope for a good marriage. I hope for my children will grow up strong and follow God. I hope that my finances will be strong. And then there's something that's added to that, which is called faith, that becomes knowing that I know that I'll have a good marriage. That I know that my kids will grow up. That I know what I'm believing for. Because it moves faith and hope when they go together, give us something very tangible, and that is the knowledge. Faith is the substance. Faith is the fruit of hope. It's the knowledge. Faith is the knowledge of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith is the fruit of hope. We need both hope and we need faith. And if you read the scriptures, you'll know that it's love, faith, and hope. There's something incredibly powerful about those three incredibly strong words for the love that we have, the hope that we have, and the faith that we have. Faith is a substance. Faith turns hope into something tangible. One of the things I've found is it's easy just to live in hope. That we can hope for things. That I can, oh, well, I hope the church grows. Oh, well, I hope our college grows. Oh, well, I hope. But then there's got to become an action of faith that we know. And when we do that, we can actually see faith come into action and bring hope into reality. Faith turns hope into something tangible. Hebrews 11.3 And Paul explaining this a little further to the Hebrew church. He says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which 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 are seen were not made... Hold on a tick. So the things which which are seen were not made of the things which were visible. So faith calls something into being. We understand that the world was formed by faith. It's explaining what, how the earth was formed. In the beginning, God spoke. There was void. There was a, 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 there was a, a void, the scriptures Genesis records. And Jesus, or God, spoke, and the earth was formed. God spoke, and, and we sometimes created it this way, as science has debated that. We created it as a big bang theory. And I imagine that when God spoke in the beginning, it was probably a large voice. I don't think it was... Let's have light. I think he said, let there be light. And there was light. But you see, it takes faith to understand that. That's why in the world today, there's a whole pile of confusion. We were at a, we were at a cave last week. We'd been away and we'd been over in uh, West Australia and went to this incredible cave. And we're there with a, 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 it had to be a toured cave. We're on a tour with it. And we had the tour guide telling us about things being millions of years old and then telling us about a whole pile of different things, which is phenomenal when you have a look at this cave. But there was a young couple there and they were talking about, well, how did it, it was 1959 when they actually, 1957, 1958, 59, they found this cave. And they found it by a a root that had gone down and the root had opened up a small hole and they felt the air come out of the, the cave as the cave contracts and expands with the air pressure. And this young couple there, they would have been early 20s, I suppose. And they said, oh, it would have been incredible. Wonder what they actually put in the hole to see. And they thought it must have been a, a candle or a... But it's 1960. I was born in 61. I said to them, hold my tick, because the, the guy was saying, oh, yeah, well, in those days, you know, it was candles and they had those things. I said, hold on a tick. They had torches. I remember them. <laughs> we actually had, you know, torches and batteries, and they actually stuck a torch down and had a look. And I thought, wasn't well, that amazing? There's a young couple there that are early twenties, and they had no concept of the sixties or the late fifties because it's so far removed. So to them, it was, oh, how could that happen? 
How could it happen? I think it's the same as us when we think about the world and we think about how the world was created. We, how could that happen? The only way we can understand it, and the same to the Hebrew people, he said, we understand, by faith we understand that the world was formed by the word of God. That it wasn't something that was always here. It wasn't something that was, ah, oh, well, here it is. And no, the world was chaos and God, the word of God formed it in hell and holds it. It's the same as we take this, this seed that has to die and fall to the ground, Scripture says, before it can grow. We have to actually have faith to plant it. If you're a farmer in this place and you take your seeds, you have to have faith that you plant your seeds and they sprout and grow. I have a farmer friend of mine who lost his faith for farming. His words. He said, Ken, I've lost my faith for farming. I cannot put this seed in the ground. <coughs> I cannot put this hundreds of thousands of dollars of seed in the ground. Because he lost his faith for farming. Because you have to have faith to actually step in and plant these seeds. You have to have faith when you step into your life and you step through your life to believe God. It actually comes out of this thing called faith. We have to actually understand that the things we call those things that aren't as though they are by faith. We call it into being. We create. That's why you'll always hear me talk around faith confessions. Faith confessions are things we speak out because we know if we speak out something, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So as we actually speak, it says as we speak, we hear. Faith comes from hearing. <coughs> That's why it's incredibly important that we speak faith. That's why when we actually allow negativity to come around our life and, and we, we allow the things to come around our life that pull us down, it actually pulls us down because we speak it out and hear it. And the opposite effect, the faith that comes from hearing and hearing from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the Word of God. You can tell I haven't preached for a couple of weeks. It's, um, yes, please. It's... Um, it's actually as you actually start to speak out, you actually start to activate your faith. Thank you. Actually start to activate your faith. And that faith builds by actually what we hear. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's the tree of life. Now, if we go back to Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then we come to Proverbs. Faith deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's the tree of life. The marry of faith and hope. Desire. Desire can be explained as faith. Desire can be explained as vision. You see, there's been something incredibly powerful about what you see and what you marry up in what you see and what you marry up in what you hear to actually bring what you hope for into existence. Hope deferred, well, in other words, if what you're hoping for is not happening, if what you're, you're starting to hope and you haven't got this mix of faith and then your, faith, your hope is deferred, it says it makes your heart sick. Has anyone ever been there? When things aren't happening, when things aren't going the way you think they should go and, and then all of a sudden your heart get sick and you start to then talk negative, you start to see the problems rather than the opportunities, you start to look at life through a set of, uh, a, a set of eyes that see things as half empty rather than half full, you start to live in a pessimistic way rather than live in a way that sees possibility, it's where your desire goes. But when your desire comes, when your faith comes, yeah. when your vision comes, it's when you actually start to see things come to pass. And the thing that I love about faith is it doesn't have to be big faith. It's mustard seed faith. Because sometimes I think we look at people and go, wow, 
Look at their faith. They are so much people of faith. But we've all got that. You think, oh, well, the pastor's got to pray for me. No, no, no. That's why we have small groups, because there's incredible power when we pray for people, where there's an activation of faith. We were, we were traveling and we met some friends of ours over in a place called Albany, which is in West Australia, down the bottom of Australia. And they were our friends from Bible College, John and Sally. And um, they started to plant a church and over there, and they, they're not now church pastors, they're now working again, but he told us some stories of faith while he was there, and I love the stories of faith. He had an uncle. It was his uncle, wasn't it? it was, and his uncle was taken to hospital, and they wrote him off. They had a thing holding him alive down his throat. They had all the different things of wrong with him. And they said to John... He'd, come, he'd turned up at the, the hospital to see his uncle, and the, uh, they said, basically, there's no hope. And John walked out and went to his car and sat in his car and then started to pray and he started to shout and he started to shout out and he said, just declare things. He said, no way that this is going to happen. I declare life. And he started to see his uncle and started to see his uncle healed and he walked back in and his uncle was still sick, but he declared over him life. And he went back and he prayed and he started to pray. And the doctor said, no, there's no hope. He said, yes, he's going to be healed. And his uncle came out of hospital the next day. And the same story that happened to my father when he came out of hospital, the specialist said, here comes my Lazarus. The same story with John's uncle was, here comes my Lazarus. He's supposed to be dead. But someone activated a mustard seed of faith that saw life. See, when the world says it's hopeless, God says there's hope. When the world says it can't happen, God says there's hope. If we'll take our mustard seed of faith... And we apply it. You see, faith can be understood as desire when faith comes. When you actually start to put faith and vision together, you start to bring that incredible power of what you can see it, you can have it. What do you see? What do you see for your life? What do you see for your family? What do you see for your businesses? What do you see for the challenges that are facing you're facing? Because it's so easy to step back and go, oh, well, I can't do anything. But then if you just can activate this one mustard seed of faith, this small amount of faith, you can bring a change to the circumstance. The problem with faith is it's only tested in adversity. That sucks, doesn't it? The only time faith is tested is in adversity. The only time we know whether we actually have faith is when it's tested. Because otherwise it's just hope. I hope it'll be okay. I hope things are going to go well. You know, the devil comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Scripture says that. The devil comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. And what's he chasing? He's chasing your faith. He's chasing your confidence. He tried it with Jesus. He said, are you sure? 
And they're the words that you hear, isn't it, when you're actually in this adversity, when your things are, uh, the challenges come your way and you, you're facing these incredible things, that adversity, the things that you hear the devil say and sometimes the things you say to yourself, am I sure? You hear it. It's a strategy of the evil one is to actually place that seed of doubt Another seed to see if he can get it to sprout. Faith can be described as confidence. And that's what the devil tries to seal, is your confidence in God. The seed of faith grows into great things. The seed of doubt destroys great things. John chapter 12, verse 24 to 26 says this. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has now come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a seed of grain falls of a seed, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me and, I, and where I am and my servant will be also. For if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So unless we allow something to fall to the ground, and what is the thing that God wants us to fall to the ground? It's our self-confidence in ourselves without God. That's not saying we can't be self-confident. It's the self-confidence without God. See, James puts it this way, faith without works is dead. And there's two sides of this, isn't there? We can go, oh, well, I just trust God and do nothing. Or do I go and say, I trust God and I do everything that I can possibly do and see God move. See, faith without works. And sometimes we think, oh, well, I can get into this hyper faith that says, I'm just going to believe God no matter what happens. But actually, we put our works into action. Faith without works is dead. We take these mustard seeds of faith and we plant them. But what's your mustard seed of faith? What is it for your life? Maybe it's in your work. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's in your family. We can take this mustard seed and plant it. We plant it by starting to speak life. We plant it by starting to declare the vision of God over our life to see things come to pass. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. By faith, we understand that Jesus came into the world and died for our sins. By faith, we believe that he rose again from the dead. The scripture says really clearly, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. something incredibly powerful that I think we need to catch and that is faith without faith it's impossible to please God but with faith we can change the world for the better for us and for others let me pray for you today Father I thank you for this incredible group of people Father I thank you if they're in this place today that you stir something of faith in us again that faith is knowing Faith is having that understanding of vision that you give us our desires of our heart and our dreams. But faith calls those things that aren't as though they are. No matter what circumstances we face, we can change it by what we call it. No matter what we face today, Lord, you are with us with that mustard seed of faith. I thank you, Father.
for people in this place that are struggling right now. People that are struggling with their faith, that are trying to wrestle through it because maybe their hope has been deferred. But Father, you stir up that vision in them, that you stir up that desire. You stir up the faith that's in them for their future. For their families, for their loved ones. Father, for the Christians that have been in this place for years and it can be so easy to go just about each day and, and not mix faith with what we do. But we take faith today and mix it with everything we do in every aspect of our day. That it becomes our works, but works mixed with faith sees incredible supernatural outcomes. Father, help us where our unbelief is, help our unbelief. Hey, just in this room right now, maybe you don't know God and faith is something that's so far from your mind that you haven't quite caught what it really means. And faith is actually caught through the power of Jesus in our life. Scripture says if you invite him into your heart, he comes into your life and changes your life. That actually you become what the Bible declares declares as being born again. It's an encounter with the living God. And maybe in this place today, you don't know Jesus. You've come into this place and you don't know him. You've just come to church. There's something incredibly powerful about knowing God, not just knowing about Him. There's something incredibly powerful about having this thing called faith in your life that changes your life and changes the life of people around you. And I'd love to give you that opportunity today. And if you've never asked Jesus into your heart and you'd like to, I'd love to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to invite you up the front. I'm not going to point you out. But if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you in this place? As I look across this room this morning, I don't want to delay it, but it's so important. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity this morning and pray for you. So Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. Father, if they know you, I ask you to bless them. If they don't know you, Lord, I ask you to woo them, that they'll come into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.